So I don't know what side of the camp you live on when it comes to cats and dogs, but I'm a huge dog person. Uh, we'll just not talk about that other side. Uh, my favorite dog that I've ever had was a Great Dane named Evan. I like to name my dogs human names, because then you're like, yeah, Evan and I were just hanging out last night. And, um, Evan was about 200 pounds, and he was so tall when he stood on his hind legs that he could steal stuff off the top of our refrigerator. He was kind of mean looking, but he was super kind, and he looked really strong, but he was the biggest scaredy cat, even though he was a dog. He was weird. He was afraid of three things. Ice cubes. <laughs> you put an ice cube on the ground, and he was like, what is that? And he would just start like backing up. He's so weird. I'm like, what in the world? If somebody whistled, he would freak out. Like every other dog on the planet, you whistle and they come running towards you, right? You whistle and Evan was like, what is that? <laughs> he would get so scared, he would start shaking. And third, he was afraid, like most dogs, of storms. But he was only afraid of storms when I was not with him. And the way that I know that he was afraid of storms when I was not with him is because Evan did three things when he was afraid. One, he would chew on the couch. He was a big dog, so he had to chew on something big. Two, he would pee, like his owner, I guess. And three, if I was around him, he would just lean on me. Like he wouldn't chew and he wouldn't pee, he would just lean. He thought he was a little chihuahua and he would put all of his weight on me. So I knew that he was afraid of storms when I was gone, because one time I came home, pee everywhere, chewed on the couch. I was like, dang it. So I'm from Oklahoma, and the wind comes. You guys don't know that song? Oh, wow, I really thought that was like global. OK, so actually, do you want to know the honest truth? I forgot the lyrics for a second. What is it? The wind comes sweeping down the plains? OK, let's try that again. Do you guys mind? So I'm from Oklahoma, and the wind comes sweeping down the plains, but also so do the tornadoes sometimes. And my friends have a storm shelter, and here's what you do in Oklahoma. If you don't have a storm shelter, you get friends that have one. And then when there's a tornado warning, you just show up with food, and you have a tornado party. And you watch the news, and you eat food nervously, and then everyone survives, and it's super cool. So I'm at their house one day, and we're having our tornado party, and I hear this huge crack of thunder. And instantly, I'm like, oh my gosh, Evan is at home. I have to go get him. And they're like, no, 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 I don't think you should go. It says that the tornado storm should arrive here in 36 minutes. And I'm like, I live 10 minutes away, 10 there five to get him in the car, 10 back. We're good, I'll be back. I've got to go get him because I really love my couch and I really hate pee everywhere. And they're like, okay. So I drive and I'm like, oh gosh, please, in the name of Jesus, please don't let him have eaten my couch, please. And I open the door with my eyes closed because remember, that's what I do when I'm scared. And I open my eyes and the couch was still there. Praise the Lord. And I can't smell, so I had to kind of investigate to see if he had peed. And I didn't see any pee. And he comes around the corner, and he's shaking, and he leans all of his weight on me, and I kind of fall against the door. And I'm like, oh my gosh, buddy, it's going to be okay. You're going to come with me. And I grab the door handle, and the strangest thing, it was covered in his slobber, and it was no longer a round metal doorknob. It was like just a wad of metal. And I was like, oh my gosh, he was so scared. He was like, get me out of this house. And he's so smart though, because he knew like the door handle was the thing to get him out. And I'm like, oh man, are you kidding me? And at this very moment, the tornado sirens start going off. Now here's why tornado sirens go off in Oklahoma. Either one, the county is just in a warning, or two, the tornado is here. It's very vague. You're like, I'm not sure. Is this just a warning or am I about to die? So I panic and I start opening the door because the tornado siren's like, Ooh. that's what it does. And it just keeps doing it. And you're already panicking and it's, Ooh. and you're like, I know. I couldn't get the door open. 
Fun fact, at this time, I lived in a condo that had one way in and one way out. It was my only door. And so I'm panicking, and Evan's like, oh my gosh, this is the moment. He wasn't saying that. He was a dog. I just looked into his eyes, and I knew that's what he was feeling. And I was like, okay, what are we going to do? We're not going to die. We're going to climb out the window. So I run over, and I unlock the window, and I open it, and like a ninja, I like kick out the screen, and I jump out the window, and I'm like, come on, Evan, let's go. And he's like, there's no way I'm going out there. Again, he wasn't, he wasn't saying this. He's not Scooby. He was like, his eyes were like, there's no way. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I climb back in the house. Why my neighbors didn't call 911, I have no idea. I was like, in and out, in and out. And I like pick him up, 200 pounds, right? And I start pushing him toward the window and he's like, I'm not going out there. He's his hands on the panel. He's like, no. And I'm like, okay. I'm gonna turn you around. And I turn him around and I pick up his butt. Can I, can, do you guys say butt? Should I say hind end? I'll say his rump. How about that? So I, I pick up his rump. <laughs> I never say that word. And I like wedge it out the window, but he's so heavy that I have to like just leave him. So now he's like rump outside, <laughs> tornado sirens. I'm in now, and he's half in, and I'm like, okay, hold on. And I like climb out halfway, and I'm like getting him, and I finally get him outside. And I'm like, I should work out once a month at least. Okay, so let's go to the car. And he's just like, I can't move again. Do I have to keep telling you that he wasn't actually saying it? You're tracking with me? Okay, so I run to the car and I have to lift him. He's just like, throw, he was good for, I wished I had a cat at this moment. I could have just like thrown in. And I finally get him in the car and he was so cute. He would like set like a human, like, and I buckled him in because I'm like, we are gonna go fast because that took longer than five minutes and we're about to die. And still the tornado sirens, ooh, and I'm like, we get it. And so we get in the car and he's like leaning He's like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, no, I've got to drive. And he's like, Ugh. and I hold him I'm like, okay, we're going to be fine. All things through Christ. Jeremiah 29, 11. I don't know. John 3, 16. Like, and then I hear water or what I thought was water. It was pee. Have you guys ever seen a dog pee while he was sitting down? No. You haven't, because that's not what they do. He was like sitting like this, and I don't want to get into the science of it, but he was a boy dog, so the pee was, it was going up, <laughs> it was going down. And now I'm like in Lamentations, right? <laughs> that one verse I have memorized out of Lamentations, and I'm like, why, why God? And I'm driving, like, you can speed during tornado sirens. The cops are like, we don't care. And I get to my friend's house, and this really cool thing happens. I'm, like, teaching you guys so much about tornadoes. The, like, circulation sucks in all of the clouds. So whenever it dissipates, it's, like, the most beautiful day you've ever lived in. So we get out of the car, and it's like, ah, like, sunny. Nobody died. There was no tornado. The weathermen were wrong again. This is why we have trust issues in Oklahoma. And I get out, and my friend opens the door, and she's like, hey, Evan, what do I smell? And I'm like, just, just don't. And she's like, was it you or the dog? Because <laughs> she knows, she knows. And we get him out, and now he's just like, hey, yeah, like, I'm a, I'm a normal dog again. And she's like, why, why did you do that? And I'm like, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? Like, I love him and my couch and he's my dog and like, what if something happened to him? And like, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? But isn't Evan smart in this moment whenever he's afraid and he's lonely and he leans? I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna preach about this someday <laughs> whenever I get over like the terror of it. Because we can learn something from that. Because Evan does what every person does. When we are scared or lonely or uncertain, we need somebody to lean on. Like the song, right? We all need somebody to lean on. 
I'm such a good singer, and I don't want to, like, show up the worship team, so I'll just, like, let you guys sing that part. No, guys, I'm humble. I'm not going to, you know. That's a joke, because if you're humble, you should. Okay. So, so every person, every person in that moment, in fear, in certainty, in loneliness, they all need somebody to lean on. And as Christians, and as Christ followers, and people who wear the t-shirts and have the stickers on our water bottles and our cars, we are supposed to be that person. We are supposed to be that person that they get to lean on. And that's exactly where we found Elijah in this story today. I know you guys have been talking about him in the cave, and he had this moment where God whispered to him, and Elijah leans in, and he hears from God, and he has this moment where God stops asking him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he tells him what to do. And Elijah goes, and he does it. Because he understands something, that we represent something and we carry something. And I want to show you this story where Elijah does what all of us should do. Where he rushes in. And he rushes in for Elisha. And the question is, how far would you go for people? Would you climb in a window? Would you get messy? Would you exert yourself for people? Would you put yourself in some sort of uncertainty on behalf of them? Because if we call ourselves Christ followers and people follow us, they should be able to find Christ very quickly. But if they're not following us, we have to, as we'll see with Elijah, go out and reach them. So, do you guys have your Holy Bible? Y'all are cute, three of you. Uh, those of you that do, turn to 1 Kings. We're going to be in verse 19. We're going to be in chapter 19 and verse 19. And we are going to catch Elijah in this moment. This moment where he's reaching out, where he understands that God's purpose is to send him to reach people. And we see him doing this. So 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. It says, so Elijah went from there and found Elisha. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Weird, right? So Elijah runs after this guy, throws some clothes on him. The guy's like, let me kiss my parents. I'm burning everything. I'm going to feed all the people. We're best friends. That's basically what just happened. So, but I want to talk for just a moment about this cloak. Because when you're reading that, you're like, that's kind of strange. Imagine you're out, like, gardening or playing basketball or, I don't know, like, rollerblading. I don't know if that's something you do. And just someone just runs up to you and, like, throws their jacket on you, and you're like, that's it. I'm giving my life up for this, right? But there is this whole big, deep story in this cloak. See, Elijah wore this cloak it protected him from the heat during the day. It kept him warm from the cold at night. And for some strange reason, it was so distinct that people recognized him. It talks earlier in the chapter that King Ahab recognized the cloak and knew that it was Elijah. And I think Elijah started to trend because you'll start to hear about this cloak later on through Zechariah and even John the Baptist. He was like a total trendsetter, like me. <laughs> Guys, look. Loosen, just say, oh, that was funny. Come on, loosen up, guys. Okay, so I was making sure you're alive. You're like, we've been at the beach all day. Okay, so listen, this is important. This is very important. If you don't hear anything else, listen while I'm talking about the scripture, okay? Because what Elijah does is he takes this cloak, which really represented who he was, and who he was was a prophet of God. Like when people saw Elijah, they thought of God. When they saw him, they thought of Yahweh. And that cloak is what they saw. 
So when he takes this cloak off and puts it on Elisha, what he's doing is everything that he received from God in all of that time and in that cave, in that whisper, he goes and he puts it on him. This is the great exchange. What we see here and the question we have to ask is, what is my cloak? Like, what is it that I've received and who is my Elisha? Who do I need to put that on? And this great exchange is incredibly important for you, especially as high schoolers, to understand. There's a big story happening, and you are a part of it. Like the kingdom of God is constantly growing, but the kingdom of God is also constantly on the earth, and you are God's big marketing plan. Like he's better than the Allstate song that if I was like, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. I realize I said Allstate. It's fine. But you guys still knew, even though I baited you wrong, right? Like, you're better than that song. They planted that song so that every time you heard it, you knew how to finish it. You're his marketing plan, and you need to know that you are a part of this great exchange. And the exchange is this, that everything that you receive from Jesus has been given to you for you to give away. And this week at camp, you're just filling up, like, all of the worship and all of the prayer and all of the incredible, incredible sermons on every night but night four. And you're just, like, filling up all of this knowledge, and you're getting friendships and T-shirts and community. And when you go home, then it's your job to give that away. That's what you do. You fill it up, and you give it away. I have brothers only, all brothers, and it was my job to be the biggest pest in their lives. And my brother really loved Lucky Charms. And like, I like the marshmallows, but I don't really like the cardboard that they put in there with the marshmallows. (laughs) So when I was uh, younger, maybe second or third grade, I woke up early on a Saturday, and I had this really good plan to like make myself feel good and to destroy my brother. (laughs) And I went and I got the cereal box down, And really, like, hygiene is a big thing for me, so I dumped it on the kitchen floor. (laughs) And I, like, go through it for hours. Didn't take that long. And I separate all of the cardboard and all of the marshmallows. And then I put the cardboard back in the box that it was made of. (laughs) And I shut the box, because we don't want it to get stale. And I put it back. And then I get my shirt, and I fill it with all of the marshmallows. And I go in the living room, and I sit in front of the TV, and I watch Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and I ate every one of those marshmallows. Yes. I ate every one of those marshmallows. I grew up in the 80s, and then the marshmallows were not as exciting. There was a moon, there was a heart, there was a clover, and like a blue diamond or something. When the purple came, oh man, we lost our minds, like, hello. So I, I loved the yellow moons, and I like kept it for the end. And for some reason, I don't know why I did this, the very last yellow moon, I was like, I'm not going to chew this one. I'm going to see if I can swallow it. Um, and I just, I just swallowed the moon. This will be important in a second. And I was like, cool. Watching Power Rangers, my brother wakes up, and he's like, hey, nerd. And I'm like, I love you. And he goes, and I hear him. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is my moment. And I hear the cereal pour, pour out, and he's like, what in the world? There's no marshmallows! And more cereal, more cereal. And he's screaming, there's no marshmallows! And my mom comes out and she's like, what are you yelling about? And he's like, no, come here, you have to see this. And here's a fun fact. Um, Like, when you're a kid, you miss this very important part of understanding what your body's telling you right before you throw up. Um, (laughs) Like, when you get older, you're like, oh, my stomach feels weird. Oh, my throat. I'm like, I'm going to throw up. And then you go to the toilet, and you put your face somewhere it should never be, and you put the vomit where it's supposed to go, right? So you can just flush it, and it's gone. As a kid, you're like, man, my body feels weird, but I'm going to run to the kitchen right now. (laughs) And I'm like, what's going on? And I run, and then I just stop, and I look at my mom, and I just throw up. I'm like, blah. And it was the most beautiful vomit you have ever seen. (laughs) It was like, if a unicorn threw up, Yes, that. And my mom was a nurse, so like if it was me, I would be like, uh, okay, I can't, uh, oh, I kind of got, I kind of made myself a little sick there. And I would like run away, but my mom was like, and she, like a nurse gangster, she just bends down and looks at my vomit, and right in the middle of it was that yellow marshmallow I swallowed. <laughs> Should have, what was I thinking? And she looks at me and she goes, 
are you kidding me? <laughs> and then she said, you're cleaning that up. And she, and you know what she did? She made me use my allowance to buy him another box of Lucky Charms. I still to this day though cannot even, I see Lucky Charms and I'm like, mm. okay, it's gonna be fine. But do you know what I learned from that? What goes in <laughs> must come out. And I just really wanted to tell you that gross story. But you know, you have an opportunity this week to just fill yourself up, not at the expense of people, but fill yourself up with good things because what goes in must come out. And whatever you're filling up with this week at camp, next week when you get home and life gets hard or you meet new people or you face your enemies or you have to deal with your parents or your siblings that eat all of the marshmallows, what you took in this week will inevitably come out. And as Christians, we have an opportunity and an obligation to pass those things on. So what it looks like for you is what am I getting from Jesus? Am I receiving forgiveness? Because then I need to give that forgiveness away. Am I receiving joy? Then I need to give joy away. Am I receiving encouragement? Am I receiving freedom? Am I receiving peace? Whatever it is that you're receiving this week, even if it's friendship, it is your opportunity and your obligation to give that away. And you can start this week. But next week, that's where you shine. That's where you can understand that your purpose is to be sent out to reach others. And that that's what God created you for. What is your cloak and who is your Elisha? Because, friends, if we hold on to these things, it gets a little messy. I have an uncle named Clarence who lives on a farm. Because if your name is Clarence, you have to live on a farm. <laughs> and Clarence has a bunch of chickens. And I went to visit him, and he said, hey, I have a bunch of eggs for you. And I want you to take them home. And I said, I'm actually not going to be home. I'm, like, busy, and I think I already have eggs, and, like, you can't keep eggs very long. And he's like, no, 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 take them, take them, take them. And he brings me just a box full of eggs, because that's what you do when your name is Clarence, and you live on the farm. And he puts them in the back of my Jeep, and he's like, you know what you can do? You can be a good neighbor, like Jesus told you, and you can, like, give these away to people. And I'm like, that is such a good idea. I'm going to give this to my friends and my neighbors. This is going to be awesome. It's so great. I forgot about the eggs, like for weeks, in July, until I threw my backpack in the back of my Jeep and I heard this really weird sound. I was like, what was that? And so I get out and I open the trunk and I see the box and I pull it towards me and inside were a bunch of baby chicks. I'm just, guys, I'm kidding. It doesn't work that way from the city. It does not work that way. <laughs> oh, I got you. I was like, I hope this gets them. Got you. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm going to tell Clarence about that. He's going to like that. You know what was inside that box? Really rotten eggs. And I don't have a sense of smell, but when something smells bad enough, like my eyes burn and I get a gross taste in my mouth and I was like, oh my gosh. I can never tell anybody about this until I tell hundreds of people about this. And I throw it away, and I go pick my kids up from school, and they're like, it smells like, and I'm like, shh, no, it's you. It's you. You're the stinky one. You don't even know. I had to get my car professionally cleaned. Like, weeks later, my friends would be like, Do you, I smell like rotten eggs. And I was like, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't smell that. Gosh. I had to pay someone a lot of money. To, I don't know how smells work, so I thought when I moved the box, like, the smell was just gone. I don't know how that works. So I get it cleaned, and it's finally gone. And I had not told Clarence about it until just a couple of months ago. And he said, you are so irresponsible. And I said, thank you. <laughs> it's not the first time I've heard that. But wasn't that irresponsible of me? And it was disgusting. But I think, and I believe, and I've experienced in my own personal life, that when I just keep all of these things that I receive from Jesus, and I don't give them away, that it's irresponsible. And maybe it's even a little disgusting. 
that I would just receive all of those things, that I would freely receive forgiveness and not have the decency or the courage to then give that forgiveness away. And I know that that's a hard one. Like, I get it. But when you understand that you're fully forgiven, there is this freedom in understanding that those kingdom things are your currency. Like, what you receive from Jesus is then what you use to reach people. We're almost like bank tellers. We don't really own these things. We're just taking from this vault that is the kingdom. And we're just the in-between, passing it to these people who are desperately in need of a savior, who are in need of forgiveness and friendship and joy and all of those things that you receive from him. We are just a part of that great exchange. And you can't miss that opportunity because the kingdom needs to come to the earth. And the Lord wants to use you to do that. His purpose is for you to reach others. And your means of doing that is just by everything you receive from him. And that's what you were created to do. And Jesus and kingdom work and reaching others, it all mixes together. It's all a part of the same call and the reason why we were created. And I know life is messy, but we have these moments with Jesus. We have these experiences that change us. And what you do is you take that experience out into the world and you watch it change the world. That's your job. You're just the in-between. You're the great exchange. You're Elijah in the story. So what's your cloak and who's your Elisha? Because you were created to reach people. You were created to make space so that people could lean on you. And if Jesus Christ is inside of you, then they lean on him. And that's your opportunity, and that's your obligation, to be people who bring the kingdom to earth and freely receive it and freely give it away. And that is my prayer for you. Guys, you are so awesome. Thanks for listening, for laughing at my jokes. I want to do this. I want to do this. Um, every time a pastor prays, I'm just like, okay, what, what am I going to eat? I want, you to, I, want you to, I want you to pray for the person that you are thinking. When I'm praying for you, I want you to pray for the person that you believe is your Elisha, that person that needs to receive what you have received from Jesus. So I'm going to pray for you, and I want you to pray for them. You good? If you're not sure how to pray, they, this is like what they do in the movies, so I just always do that too. I'm going to pray for you guys.